Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Office Hours on the Red Chip Poker Podcast, where we take questions from our members and our audience and ask them of our coaches and experts. And here today, we have one of our favorites, the coach and co-founder here at Red Chip Poker, James Splitsuit Sweeney. How are you doing today, sir? Not too bad. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, and we've got a lot of great questions from our audience members. We've grouped them into various categories, and today we're going to be looking at managing bankrolls and buy-ins. This is something that we hear a lot about, and we had a few specific questions, people wondering, what do I buy in for and what stakes do I play? So is that something you feel like talking about today? Yeah, I think a lot of people have questions on this. This is a little bit more on the kind of beginner side of the spectrum, but still, you know, we need to handle these questions just as not as much as we need to handle the really advanced stuff on turn and river play. So yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, you know, that does imply that you're first starting out in poker if you're talking about learning where to start. And there's many options. There's online, there's live. Uh, this first question comes from someone who sounds like a live player, Nate, a member of Red Chip Poker. And Nate asks, many suggest to start at the low limits, 2-4 NL. Do you agree with this? So he's talking about, we're going to assume that's the lowest limit in his area. Is that a good limit to start? And how would we actually go about determining what limit to start with in the first place? So I think in general, it's good to start at the lowest possible limit that your room offers. And that's whether you're playing online and maybe that's 2NL, maybe that's 5NL, or maybe you're playing live and it's 1-2 or 1-3 or maybe 2-4. Well, whatever it is for your room, I would just play the smallest room to get started. And really, you're just trying to get comfortable with how the game works, what the dynamics look like. Be comfortable throwing money in there and just in general, like just get acclimated as quickly as possible. Now, the big thing I will say is don't get married to a limit just in general no matter where you are in your career i want you to be really fluid here and not just say like i am a 2-4 player like okay maybe that's where you started but maybe that's not where you're going to end up or maybe that's not where you're going to be for very long like a big issue i see is people kind of say okay i'm going to play one two live and then they stay there for far 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 too long and maybe they say okay i'm going to play until i have a win rate that i'm looking for or until i hit some arbitrary point or until my bankroll is big enough and, and that's xyz for for moving up but at the end of the day i would majorly suggest start smaller get comfortable and then once you're comfortable and able to assess your edge a little bit better, then start moving up. Consider taking shots more regularly and don't get married and stuck to a specific level. I see that happen far too often. You see players that are playing like 2NL online or 10NL online for just like far, far, far too long because they're like, I want to make sure that I have a a winning sample over 100k hands. And it's like, well, you could play 100K hands at 10 NL, or you could play, you know, 25K hands, be able to assess your winner and say, you know what, it's probably time that I jump up or maybe I reinfuse my bankroll with some of my life roll and now I can take a shot quicker. So that's kind of the big thing I say is, you know, start smaller, but do not be afraid to start moving up, be it really, really quickly or again, really once you're able to assess where your edge actually lies. Yeah, that reminds me of a podcast I did with Doug Hall on Bankroll where he talks about, especially if you're starting out in poker, you know, you're really using that first buy-in. He calls it the golden buy-in, and you're just trying to win, essentially. You can't manage your bankroll until you start to learn how to win at this game. So uh, assuming that you do have the bankroll to play in the first place, uh, it seems like, you know, you may have to progress a little bit before you manage your bankroll. But I think a lot of even the most recreational players who are just first stepping into their first live game, let's say, have some ambiguous goals in mind. You know, they do want to build that bankroll and they imagine maybe moving up. And this next question comes from Greg, who's also known as Fish and Chips uh, in our membership. And uh, this is about building a bankroll at low stakes cash. He's asking, he, he says, I'm trying to build a bankroll in low stakes cash. Should I stay away from tougher low stakes games until I have enough money to sustain a few losses? I keep losing at one particular $5 on the button home game that plays rather large. So what advice would you give to Greg here? Sure. So just starting out, whenever you're playing in a game that has a mandatory straddle or a straddle that happens regularly, you're playing in a much bigger game, right? So if you're playing in this game and there's a Mando 5 on the button, realistically, you're playing 2-5. 
And the question you have to ask yourself is, am I bankrolled for 2.5? Should I be taking a shot at 2.5 if I'm not properly, properly bankrolled? And is this going to be a proper game for me? Now, just in general, like a big piece that I hear from this question is, do you have a bankroll in the first place? Because the whole point of having a bankroll is to lower your risk of ruin and be able to handle losses when they do come. Because it doesn't matter how well you play in this game, you're going to sustain losses for either sessions or multiple sessions or multiple months and I digress. So really that's why you have a bankroll. So if you can't withstand losses, then I'd say you're probably not ready to play this game financially speaking or even mentally speaking. Because if I walk into a game and I'm not prepared to lose three, four, five buy-ins, should I really be playing that game? I'd say probably not because I can't withstand the bad side of things and I'm probably going to minimize myself or cap myself in some capacity even on the upside of things. So again, that's kind of like a really zoomed out answer, but at the end of the day, understand one, what the straddle or mandatory things like antis and cash games will do to the game size. And then also really consider, do you have a bankroll? Bankrolls are meant so you can withstand bad things. Bad things can and will happen. And just to be clear, like when we're talking about bankrolls, it doesn't mean that you have to have some like arbitrary 25 buy-in set aside under your mattress in a bag. That's not necessarily the case, but if you have a day job and you're able to, you know, put some of that day job money into your bankroll so that way you're again able to withstand storms in poker, that's a good thing. But if you don't have much money coming into it or you don't have much extra disposable income at the end of the day to throw into it, then your bankroll is inherently much more limited and you should be choosing games that work for that. Even if the choice is, hey, I'm just not going to play for a couple of months while I rebuild my finances and I'm going to spend that time focusing on studying and talking about hands in the forum rather than just playing. Because again, if you can't withstand it mentally or financially, and I should say and financially, then it's probably something that you shouldn't be doing right this moment if I'm being totally honest. And there's a big discrepancy between buy-ins, obviously, at, you know, an online game versus a live game. And live games, we often have to plunk a few hundred dollars on the table just to, to get in there. But if you have a very small bankroll, as I'm sure a lot of our watchers and listeners do, there's always those options. And what I wanted to ask you is, can you pick up bad habits? I know a lot, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, starting in play money, let's say, you can pick up all sorts of weird habits that just don't actually exist in real money. Is that same concern there when you're starting out playing the online micros? Does that actually prepare you to go and play live when your bankroll is big enough to do that? I'd say it would. I mean, you're not really going to develop a live bankroll playing online micros just because in order to make even a couple buy-ins at your lowest one, two live, you know, playing 10 no limit or two no limit or five no limit online, like it's just going to take forever and a day to even amass a couple live buy-ins at that limit. So I, I'm really not looking at it from that point of view when I'm talking about playing online micros. I'm talking about it more just from getting acclimated with how the game flows, dynamics, what you're paying attention to, what your checklist look like and get it in some sample sizes so you can actually play some hands and say, you know what, I'm going to go study these hands. Because one of the toughest things to do when you're studying but not playing very much is you don't really have hands to study. You don't really have experiences that you need to go back and dissect. And, you know, you can use the forum for that to, to kind of counteract a little bit. But at the end of the day, you need to be putting in hands. You need to be thinking about things and making real-time decisions and then studying and reflecting on those later. So I think playing online is really, really good for that. You're not really going to amass much of a live bankroll, but you can definitely get in the study and some of the volume that you need to be getting. And even if that's just a couple hours per week online, I mean, based upon how many hands you can see per hour compared to live, you can start generating some decent sample sizes, get some hands, get some spots, and, and have someone to talk about when it comes to study times, either with a coach, with yourself, on the forum, whatever it be. That makes sense. And, you know, of course, when we talk about, you know, what we're buying into, uh, or how much we're buying in for, rather, uh, there's different rules in, in all different places. And one also could think, well, is it just short stacking a good strategy? if we don't have a very large bankroll. So that gets into the next question, but that, that's kind of a addendum I'd like to ask you is, is short stacking kind of a solution to having a small bankroll? But we'll get the question first is from Umaga and he asks, hey James, playing in LA casinos, one, two, uh, the max buy-in here is 40 to $60. Should we avoid playing these tables since we are looking at 20X, 30X? Should I have a bankroll to go to 300 NL instead at 2.5, which is 60X? We cannot use our full arsenal that we learn in Core, which is, of course, our training platform. So he's got that question. It's kind of along the short stacking thing. Can you tell us a little bit about 
how we approach short stacking and how that is a consideration within a bank role. Sure. So short stacking in general is very, very mathematical. And the stuff that we talk about in core, in pro, in a lot of our crash courses, just in general is going to be more full stacking focused, unless it's tournament specific, because tournaments inherently are going to be played oftentimes at kind of that shallow to medium stack depth. So a lot of the stuff that we do talk about, and even stuff I talk about in YouTube videos and stuff, is going to typically be very cash game centric with a higher buy-in, you know, be it something like 80 big blinds or 100 big blinds or 200 big blinds. So when you're playing in a game, and I'm assuming this is commerce because commerce uh, I know has this weird cap structure on the games themselves, like it just kind of sucks if we're being totally honest, but the game is very, very mathematical when you're crafting a strategy for it. So what I would definitely suggest is spend some time, work on the math, understand what your open raising ranges should be, understand what your three bet over the top ranges should be pre-flop, understand there's not going to be a tremendous amount of post-flop play, and even if there is, it's typically going to be very, very shallow shallow SPR, where again, a lot of your stuff is very, very mathematical. So a lot of your orientation and focus playing these shallow games is going to be pre-flop play with a little bit of flop play. Now that's great, but does that fully prepare you for playing 100 big blind games or 200 big blind games? No, because a lot of that you're going to need to have some really solid turn and river strategy. So what I would say is think about the games that you have, the games that you play in regularly, the skills that are required most most importantly for that game type, and then craft your strategy sessions around it. So if this is the only game you have, be it because you're playing a commerce or because whatever home game you play at tends to play really shallow, and you say, you know what, it is worth my time to play these games. If that's the case, then your off-table time should reflect that. And again, if you're playing shallow, work on the preflop stuff. Work on your flop playing small and medium SPRs. That's going to be really, really beneficial. So is it something that I would prefer to do? No, because I think that I'm going to have a much higher hourly when I'm playing at a stack depth that is more favorable to the time that I've worked in, the edges that I've built, and the way that I think I'm going to be able to generate edge differential against other opponents. So for me, that means playing deeper, which means if I have two options to go to the shallow game or to go to the deeper game, I'm always going to go to the deeper game. So this is where you really have to think about, okay, what are my options? What's going to maximize my time and my hourly? What's going to allow me to utilize my edge, both right now and the edge that I'm generating, and then go forward from there? So kind of a long-winded answer, but at the same time, this is one I think a lot of people would overlook. But even if you're in somewhere like California and you're, you're playing in commerce, you know, there are other games that do have different stack depths around you. So then you have to do a time time measurement of is it more beneficial for you to go to those games or for you to maybe shave a little bit of traffic time off, stay in the commerce game, and again, really start working on maximizing your edge and hourly in that game specifically. Yeah, we posted a, a question on Instagram and kind of asked people, what is your average buy-in at 1-2? And a few people were just kind of like, that's a dumb question. You know, we'd always buy in for the max. We always want to be as deep as possible. But I'm kind of kind of curious is there a game in which you know based on the way it's playing or based on the the player frequencies and so forth that you would point at and you would say that is a game where i am going to be buying in for the minimum and, and trying to double up that is a an optimal strategy does that game exist so you can definitely come up with situations and variable sets that say okay it's going to be better for me to short stack this game but there's a couple major things you have to keep in mind. You might have a really good edge at the shorter buy-in, no problem. We can we can say mathematically that could actually be true. But if you do have that great edge, at some point you're going to double up, right? Because that's part of what happens with your edge. Or you're going to win a couple of small pots, and you're going to end up with roughly 2x the amount of money that you started with. So when that's the case, now what's your edge differential, right? So if you're really good at 50 and everyone else is playing with 100, and you utilize your 50 edge, you get yourself up to 100 as well, now all of a sudden is their 100 edge like way better than yours? Because if so, unless you can somehow get off the table as soon as you double up, which is you know, really not the case in, in, I'm sorry, in live games, sometimes it is in online environments, but in a live environment, like that's not an option. So rather than say, okay, I'm going to become the sickest 40 big blind player or 50 big blind player or 60 big blind player, 
I'd rather say, okay, well, even if I do get really, really sick of that and spend a lot of time really crafting the strategy that's awesome for that, eventually I'm going to have to play 100 big blinds, and eventually I'm going to have to play 200 big blinds. So I'd rather work on becoming a really competent 100, 200, and 300 big blind player than I would spending a bunch of time working on crafting like a 40 big blind strategy, because again, you're going to have to eventually play 100. Whether or not you want to, you're probably going to end up having to. So uh, again, like I'd rather sacrifice a little bit of my 40 big blind game to have a much better 100 and 200 big blind game. And I think in general, if you're looking more long term over your strategy, I'm sorry, over like your entire career and your strategy within that career, I think it makes more sense for you to take that approach. That makes 100 percent perfect sense. And, you know, this is fascinating. So. What if you were to go the other direction and talk about way, way deep, lots of buy-ins? And this is kind of a personal question because in some of the home games, really most of the home games I play, there's a rule such that you know you can buy up to the max stack at the table or 75% of the max stack. We have a rule like that in my home game, and that allows for people to stay in action and feel like you know they can quote unquote you know stack up against the bigger stacks there. And I was always wondered, like, is there a scenario in which always topping up is not the, the most strategically best thing? Because, you know, you could argue that, you know, people have, especially me, have very little experience playing that super deep, like, you know, 400, 500 big blinds. And so it, could that be a strategic disadvantage? Would you want to kind of not do the top ups? So, uh, yes, very much. You can come up with solutions where it just doesn't make any sense, right? If you have 100 and your option is you can either stay at 100 or top up to 500 and play there, like if you're playing against someone who has a really, really solid 500 big blind strategy, yeah, it probably doesn't make any sense for you to put yourself at that massive edge reversal. So I might at that point just keep my, my 100 or whatever my stack size is right that moment. Now, that being said, if the dude who has 500 bigs is really bad... Even if you're not super comfortable and confident at 500, chances are your edge is still there because they're just simply not a great player. So it would make sense for you to top up to 500. But because we're playing in a home game, we're playing in this live environment, now we have a really curious question. Because if we top up to 500 to meet the fish, what are the other players going to do as well? Are they going to stay where they are, or are they also going to top up to 500? And then I have to think about, okay, if they also come along and top up to 500 with me, where's my edge lie against them? Am I bankroll sufficient here? Can I actually handle this? And again, what is realistically going to happen if I do and if I don't make this top off? So it's oftentimes more of like a curious thought experiment than it is something that comes up often. But by the same token, I think it's a fun thought experiment nonetheless. And, And this is just kind of the way that I would visualize it and think about it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think even though this is in the beginner realm uh, you know, of strategy in the sense of you know, cho- you know, a lot of pros out there, a lot of more experienced players, they know what they're buying into, they, they're comfortable with their stakes, they've even maybe got a plan for you know, increasing their bankroll and moving up. But you know, we're always thinking about how much we buy in for, and especially in tournaments when our you know, blinds fluctuate, we're always thinking about uh, you know, the size of our stack there too. So this last question uh, comes from Dean H, and this is another specific question. We've talked a, a little bit about this already, but just another example to kind of discuss here. He says, I play in a 5-5 no limit hold'em game. How much of a disadvantage if I start with 60 big blinds as opposed to the rest of the table at 100 big blinds? So this is right along the lines of what is the rest of the table doing and what are they going to do? Yeah. So again, this is another thing where you might not be automatic so like a lot of people think like if someone has a shorter stack and someone has a deeper stack that the person with the deeper stack automatically has a better edge in cash games and that's just simply not the case they might but they probably don't in a lot of scenarios because if someone chooses the shorter stack size chances are one of two things either they're not a good player that's naturally trying to limit their losses and and play in something that they're more comfortable with which is quite common or it's someone who's put in a lot of time and effort and study at that stack depth and most likely has a pretty large edge compared to the person who hasn't spent a lot of time studying 60 70 and 80 big blind play Okay, no problem at all. So again, you can come up with sets where it makes sense that the person with the smaller stack size has an edge. Now that being said, again, once you utilize that edge, what's going to happen? Probably going to win some pots. Now you're right back up to 100 big blinds. Now where's the edge differential? Has that per- person put in so much extra work at 100 big blinds and you have put in a lot of time at 50 and 60 but really don't have as much experience at 100 you're doubling up to a situation where you're going to have an edge differential that's not favorable. 
Now, it just is what it is, but again, that says and, and really speaks volumes to why you need to be putting a lot of time and effort in at 100 and 200 big blind stack depth rather than getting overly focused in, I'm going to develop the sickest 50 big blind or sickest 60 big blind strategy out there. Could you do it? You betcha. I've worked with people that have put in heaps and heaps of effort and attention to detail when it comes to playing the shorter stack sizes. Heck, early in my career, I went through a stage where I was like, you know what, I want to become a really, really good 20 big blind player. Because back back then, you used to be able to buy in for, for 20 big blinds. Now some sites, they cap it at 40, but whatever. So I went through that phase and there's still some of that math rattling around in the back of my head. So I'm like, I'm okay at that stack depth, but is it where my edge naturally lies nowadays? No, because I put in so much effort at 100, 200, and 300 big blind stack depth that that's where I'm going to find myself playing most of the time. That's where I'm going to find myself playing against other opponents. And if I can have more study and confidence and ability at that stack depth, why would I not spend more time studying that as opposed to focusing on the shorter stack? Again, I know it can get you know a little confusing and we can get rambly and a little long in the tooth in this stuff. But by the same token, like, I don't know. I'd say don't overly focus on the shorter stack stuff. Is it okay to study it a little bit? Sure. But honestly, what I do is I look at spots where I'm playing my normal game and I run into a short stacker and then I'll try to like reverse engineer what the heck they're doing, where they could have made improvements. And that's kind of where I spend my study time, quote unquote, looking at the shorter stack game. I'm not spending like weeks at a time saying, how can I become the greatest 50 big blind player in the world? Assuming I have other options available, I'm going to focus more on 100, 200, and 300 big blind stack depth and get a much bigger yield, a much better return on investment on that time spent. Well, that makes a great case for that buy-in size. And this, uh, the whole time we've been talking about this, I've been thinking about an anecdote of a, of a game that I played in and really a turning point in my whole poker life. And so maybe I can share that and, and get your thoughts to close up the discussion here. Sure. And it, it was one of these games where I sat down and there was a woman who, you know, had around a thousand dollars at a one-two table, and I observed her for you know about an hour or two just running over the table, classic super loose aggressive player that was getting away from any hand where she got resistance. Um, so very passive kind of tight you know table except for this woman. And I observed her doing this, and, you know, plenty of people are doing the short stack buy-ins for 60 for 100, you know, donk it off to her, buy-in for another 100. And I lost a few hands versus her, and, and I was buying in for the max, three, 300 buy-ins. Uh, and, but I knew that, you know, she was playing so poorly, her frequency was so imbalanced that this provided a golden opportunity to, you know, double up here. And in fact, that's, that's what I ended up doing. I, I got dealt kings in an early position. I... I raised, uh, she three bet me, and I decided to call there to kind of let her hang herself in the parlance of poker terms. And I was at a position, you know, she, she bet into me on the flop, bet into me on the turn, you know, nothing but really a pretty static flop, you know. Uh, none of the draws come in on the river, and uh, she bets into me once more, and I'd raise her and get called, and I'd, I'd, I'd double up. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not the exact action, but it was something similar to that and I just realized like had I not bought in for the max uh, you know every time I lost uh, and not identified that opportunity then I would have never doubled up and subsequently I continued to chip away at her until the rest of the table sort sort of picked up on the fact that you know you could defend against this kind of thing and it was just a fascinating study in how table dynamics can change and how you can identify someone who you know, my inexperienced amateur mind would look at and be scared of. Here's someone who's running over the table with a grand in front of them at one, two. And instead, it became this opportunity that I was just waiting for the right moment to take advantage of. Exactly right. And, and this is why this, you know, if we, we actually rip like a couple of layers off of that onion, we're looking at you looking at your edge differential. We're looking at you making decisions based upon edge and not just based upon how scared you are or are not about losing a couple of bucks, be it small amount of dollars or a large amount of dollars. And you're making strategic adjustments to take advantage of this person, again, maximizing your edge against them. And then you're creating a buy-in size that works within that edge as best as possible by in for 300 bucks instead of buying in for you know 80 bucks or 100 bucks or anything like that so that's exactly the right proper adjustment for it and again understanding what's going into that is more important than just saying always buy in for max 
or always buy in for 100 big blinds because that doesn't fully look at the entire picture. So I'd say you did that exactly the right way. But it's important that we understand the reasoning and the rationale, not just the what did you do, also why did you do it. Right. Well, hopefully we gave our listeners and our watchers some serious food for thought on that subject. I think we covered it pretty thoroughly. Anything else to add? No, that all sounds good to me. I had fun with this. Awesome. Well, hopefully uh, your next buy-in is nice and smooth and you are super confident in what you're doing based on what you've heard today. And thanks again, James, for joining us. Indeed. Thanks for having me, sir.